Somewhere, hundreds of miles from the nearest city, deep in the forests of New Hampshire, sits a grand old hotel. It was here, 70 years ago, that America was crowned the world's economic superpower. It was here, in these halls and corridors, that the world changed forever. Now, it is on the brink of changing again. I think this is a decisive election for the United States, and it will matter importantly for the world economy and the global financial system. China's taken us over. Nothing's American-made anymore. Whatever we asked in the United States about Brexit will be nothing compared to what you Brits will angst about if we elect Trump. That's what all presidents say. They want to make America great. I'm 51, I still haven't seen it yet. It's very clear that America's role as the dominant force in the global economy is coming to an end. We're in the Great Hall of the Omni Mount Washington Resort in Brenton Woods, New Hampshire. Uh, this was the last of the grand hotels to be built. Probably one of the more paramount times in our history was obviously the Monetary Conference of 1944. To be discussed are plans for the stabilization of world currencies. This is the place where, where those 44 nations came to kind of guide us out of World War II. You can literally say that you know, establishing uh, the price of gold at $35 an ounce and really making the dollar uh, the dominant currency that would back that gold up uh, happened right here at this location. The United States, since World War II, has played the role of global architect of major institutions. I mean, all of the global organizations, the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, the Bretton Woods Accord, those all sound very global. They are American institutions, American values, American allies, American standards, American capital, American priorities. American industry to save production costs. So what happened? What happened to the American dream? which brought decades of prosperity, growth, innovation, new products, new services, free trade, free flows of capital, not just for America, but for the entire world. When did all this turn into a nightmare? At least part of the answer is what happened to America's Rust Belt. While Wall Street boomed, the factories here are abandoned, empty, victims of cheap competition from Mexico and China. Welcome to the city of Reading, Pennsylvania. Back in 2010, we were considered the poorest of the nation, of the city of its size. We've had people that have come through our system because the tannery, they worked in a tannery, the tannery left and went to Mexico. Um, they're going overseas. So we see a lot of good, you know, hardworking people frustrated coming into homeless services saying, I never thought this would be me. We thought we could retire here. We thought this, we could raise our family this way. And it just was pulled out from under them. One time we were known as the outlet capital of the country. I think back when this was booming and you, know, you couldn't find a parking space here. People came from all over the country. It was really vibrant and now look at it. So there's a lot of hopelessness and desolation. I mean, imagine getting up in the morning and this is what you see. This doesn't give you hope. You know, they're looking at this type of thing and you know, sort of feel like, you know, I've been kind of forgotten. We've been forgotten here. Hello. How are you doing, sir? Hope for Reading, the motto of this homeless shelter. Without a job, you cannot get anywhere. And the way the economy is now, you see how the economy is. It's, it, it's so many closed buildings here. A lot of abandoned houses, a lot of abandoned stores down on Penn Street. I mean, nobody's buying. That's what all presidents say. They want to make you know, America great. I'm 51, I still haven't seen it yet. There's always problems. I think when I was a kid, it was a prosperous place. And now, now that I'm growing up and I'm seeing what my dad went through, it's, it's hard. It's not a prosperous place because they put you to struggle out there. And I think the frustration is the Main Street. They've lost the confidence in the Republican and Democrat. One of the largest um, rallies I've seen here in a while was the Bernie Sanders rally. They, they want something different. They're saying this isn't working. Bernie Sanders particularly pulled Hillary Clinton very, very far towards a less trade-friendly policy. 
I think in the Republican Party, which is completely roiled and in chaos to some extent, I'm not sure Trump's position's representative. The fact that it's working, that uh, he has so much of the vote, that he was able to win the Republican nomination, may influence other candidates running for the House of Representatives, for the Senate. Now, I'm certainly very concerned about what this shows for the future in the United States, at least the next five years of a country retrenching less confident about its role in the world, less confident about trade. Safety beam guardrail is cold formed from strip steel. But try to put yourself in the position of the people who live here in the Rust Belt, who worked for industrial giants like Bethlehem Steel, who helped build the skyscrapers and railroads. While the rest of America powered on, this place feels like it was left behind. After 140 years of continuous hot metal production, the furnaces are cold and silent this Christmas. The passing of an era that has left Bethlehem with little to celebrate in this season of goodwill. Given that many of the jobs here fell victim effectively to cheap imports from overseas, perhaps there's no surprise that both of the candidates have disavowed free trade, whether that's TPP, TTIP, even existing deals like NAFTA. Why stay open? when effectively, that means places like this get closed. Bethlehem Steel was about employees. If you worked at the bottom of Bethlehem Steel and you stayed long enough, you worked your way up the ladder, you, you had wonderful benefits, you had perks, you had a lot of things that um, in today's world are not seen in corporate America. The Free Trade Act was kind of like thrown at us, forced on us. And I don't know if it was the right thing to do. If you're a blue-collar guy, you better be a serious worker here to survive. To bring jobs back to our country, you know, should be a priority. You know, we have young children graduating college and having no job market. China's taking us over, really. You know, it's like we're, nothing's American-made anymore. If you look at the clothing, nothing's American-made. America needs to support America, and then it would maybe get somewhere. But America is supporting wherever they can get it cheaper. There is another current, and there is a sentiment in the population. And it's not only in, in the U.S., it's in other countries as well, uh, which try to reject the system. Uh, reject the system that is not providing them the level of comfort and security that they would expect from that. That message is coming out quite loud and clear. Now, the response that has been found to those sentiments has been, we'll take care of that. Don't worry, vote for me. We'll take care of that because we will stop imports from country A, B, C, D, etc., etc. In terms of um, actual policies, that will be the wrong policy. It starts with the wrong diagnosis. If you diagnose the problem as a trade problem, you begin with the wrong diagnosis, and then you prescribe the wrong medicine. The World Trade Organization, which sits here on the banks of Lake Geneva, is in many senses the home of globalization. These men and women spend their days discussing trade barriers, trying to cooperate. This is America's post-war legacy. What's unique about this place is that every nation from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe gets a say. It's all done through consensus. And the question is, what kind of a world does the next US president want us to live in? Is it one where things are agreed this way? Or is it going to be every country for itself? If the country like the United States disconnects from the global economy, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. It's a catastrophe for the economy. So that is not going to happen. Any of those policies that are being proposed, if implemented, actually, you're out of power in four years. As it happens, this very building was originally built as the headquarters of the League of Nations, the precursor to the UN. It fell apart because the US refused to become a member. An important lesson. I went to dozens, if not hundreds, of international meetings, and the only ones that worked were the ones that followed US leadership. If the US does not give leadership, whether it's to the G7 or the G20, then very little happens. If Mr Trump were to be elected, we really have no idea what he would do. But it clearly is unlikely to be a cooperative movement in the world economy. I think there's a lot of uncertainty as to what the US will do, and it matters at this juncture. 
Well, we've been trying, trying with politicians. Look at what we got these days. Could use a Washington, a Jefferson, a Lincoln, a Roosevelt. See, those men were a different breed. They believed that working men were good men and treated them with dignity. With Trump as president, I'm afraid that we will see a world that is not op as open as it has been and might change development in the world. And I think that would be to go in the wrong direction. But of course, also Hillary Clinton has been skeptical to some of the trade agreements. So um, I hope that if she becomes president, we will still see a development towards a more open and globalized economy. I do think there is a, a danger that the, that the next administration, whatever its identity, will draw back from globalization. And if that danger eventuates, we're going to have to blame ourselves for not having done more to um, uh, deal with the problem of secular stagnation and not having done more to deal with the problem of inequality. It is autumn in America. But what comes next? An economic freeze or the green shoots of recovery? The reality is the US has always had a bit of an ambivalent attitude towards its role as leader of the free world. There have always been disillusions about the state of the economy and about the way that that money is being shared between people. But throughout the years, this country has shown a remarkable attitude at reinventing itself, at boosting growth and coming back from the brink. As the great British economist John Maynard Keynes said at the conference here at Bretton Woods in 1944, how much better that our projects should begin in disillusion than that they should end in it. 